Online with Terry Jeffrey, a CNS News production. Hi, and welcome to this edition of Online with Terry Jeffrey. Our guest today is Ben Shapiro, author of Primetime Propaganda, the true Hollywood story of how the left took over your TV. Ben is a native of Hollywood. He graduated from UCLA and Harvard Law School. At the age of 17, he became the youngest syndicated columnist in the United States with the Creator Syndicate, and you can read his column, by the way, on cnsnews.com. He has previously written the best-selling books, Brainwash, Porn Generation, and Project President. Ben, thanks for coming in. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. You know, your, your family uh, sounds a little bit like mine. When I was a kid, I was a generation older than you, but when I was a kid, my parents didn't want me watching primetime <laughs> entertainment TV. They wanted to keep us away from that stuff. Uh, but your pa family was like that, but you lived right in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. I mean, I grew up in Hollywood. Both my parents work in the industry. Uh, my mom is a, a reality TV, basically, producer. She does business affairs on shows like Hell's Kitchen. Uh, my dad does uh, music for film and TV. Uh, but, they, but they were very focused on, look, you're not going to watch The Simpsons, you're not going to watch Friends, we're going to go out, we're going to rent episodes of The Waltons, we'll go out and rent episodes of Dick Van Dyke. So I grew up on kind of classic TV. And you, you believe your parents are right. Yeah, no, they're, they're totally right. I mean, that doesn't, the, the problem is, it didn't really stop me from watching. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is sort of the conservative dilemma, right? We all, we all know what we ought to be watching, and then right. there's kind of what we watch when we go home and kick off our shoes at night. And very often we end up watching Will and Grace and Friends and the same kind of shows that the rest of the country is watching in the, in the heavy urban areas. But, but, but literally from birth, you were someone who grew up in and around Hollywood yeah. and understand the Hollywood experience and have seen it pretty close up. Oh, yeah. I mean, my mom, you know, she, we have four kids in our family. If you have four kids in Hollywood, that's the equivalent of having 12 kids anywhere else. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just how could you possibly have four children? It's unbelievable. I mean, when, when people talk about the American dream being you know, two and a half kids and a, and a white picket fence, in Hollywood, it's like half a kid and, yeah. a, and a white picket fence. Yeah, so the kid <laughs> if he makes it. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, tell me a little bit about how you did this book. I think, you know, tell me about how you, you put this together and the research and the reporting. You did on uh, well, I mean, what, what was really fun about doing this book is beyond doing all the kind of archival research and watching the shows and going back and looking uh, at all of the archived interviews with, with some of the older folks, what was really fun is I went behind the scenes and I talked to all the people who made these shows. Uh, and the way that it worked was I I have to admit, I probably took advantage of their stereotyping. Uh, liberals are some of the most bigoted people on the planet, uh, and so they tend to group people by race, gender, ethnicity. Well, for me, I'm obviously Jewish. Right? I mean, that's what the yarmulke is for. Uh, and so when I email them, my last name is Shapiro. I mean, it's a very Jewish last name. I went to Harvard Law School. They probably figured, okay, this guy's for sure liberal. And when I went into the interviews, I would wear my Harvard Law baseball cap, which, by the way, it, I've, been, I've caught flack for that as though I'm James O'Keefe, you know, dressing up as a pimp. And the, 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 the fact is that... Um, and Michael Moore wears his baseball cap. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I, I wear my baseball cap all the time because as an Orthodox Jew, I've got to cover my head, right? And I'm proud of where I went to school because it's cool. So it's, it's, I wore that in there. They assumed I was a liberal, and they spoke on tape. Now, one of them, Vin DeBona... They, they assumed you were a liberal just because you went to Harvard Law. Yeah, yeah and, and because I'm Jewish, and because I'm Jewish, right? If my last name had been Whitfield or something, then forget it. But, but I think that what, what, really was, what really struck them when I emailed them is I said, look, I, I'm doing a book about the history of television. I'm profiling the biggest names in television, and I want to look at the history of social messaging in TV, going from Dick Van Dyke to Sex and the City. Well, that's exactly what the book is about. I think they latched on to biggest names in TV. Mm -hmm. Ego kind of kills in Hollywood. Right. And so these people all wanted to be the biggest names in TV. And right. so when I said that, they immediately went there. And they said, okay, he's safe, he's a liberal. They, they never bothered to Google. The only one I know who Googled was Diane English, who uh, created Murphy Brown, and she refused to do the interview because I was conservative. So most of these people aren't into deep research. No, <laughs> you know, exactly. You look at the creator's website and read your call. Yeah, exactly, but for the last 10 years, right? I mean, I, I think that what was really funny is that one of them, Vin Bona, who's the producer of America's Funniest Home Videos and MacGyver, I got him on tape saying that he's okay with discrimination against conservatives and he's happy about it, actually, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he came out and he said, I was deceitful in obtaining the interview. And what I said, what I said is yeah, there, there was, there's no deceit, number one. But number two, what he's really saying is he's ticked off that I didn't tell him I was a conservative. Because if I told him I was a conservative, he either wouldn't have done the interview or he would have lied. Mm -hmm. When they speak to their friends behind closed doors, that's what's in primetime propaganda. Mm -hmm. right? This is what they say when they think that they're speaking to people with whom they agree. This is a real story about Hollywood and the TV industry, not only from your personal experience, but from this very deep research and all these interviews and really going through it. This is a history of what really happened. Yeah. Now, um, one of the things, looking at your book, it will remind people is how new an industry television is. In, in other words, you know, my parents were born in the 1920s. 
they didn't grow up with TV. Right. TV was something that happened when they were adults. They'd already been through World War II. Talk a little bit about the start of the TV industry and. I mean, when did it really start yeah, as a popular phenomenon? I mean, just like every other industry, it was started by conservatives. You know, mm -hmm. the people who created TV are people like General Sarnoff, who worked, who was a general under Dwight Eisenhower during World War II. And it was started by people like Bill Paley, who was kind of a quasi-conservative. Leonard Goldenson was a liberal, but he was also, you know, a, a quintessential kind of Jewish entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, it was started by mostly conservative people, or at least people who had a conservative business sense. And it started off with radio. When you hit the 50s, then TV really starts to take off in the aftermath of World War II, right? There's a booming economy. People can afford TVs. It starts to become cheaper and cheaper as a medium uh, in order to, I mean, it used to be that when you bought a TV, it was the equivalent of, of spending, you know, probably $5,000 now on a TV. Then it automatically, then it started to become cheaper. So as in the late 19 40s, middle-class families couldn't afford oh, that, That's right. It was a very upper-class phenomenon, and the programming reflected that. I mean, they actually had opera on Sundays mm -hmm. on TV. They, they had symphony, symphony concerts on it, TV. It, and it was an East Coast thing? I mean, the production... Very TV. New York. Very, right. very New York, right? It was all vaudeville people. Um, even in the, the, the popular programming at the very beginning, it was all old vaudeville people, old radio people, um, and largely Jewish, uh, largely socialistic in terms of the creatives. But because the executives were all conservative, you ended up with kind of this happy medium. The executives kind of quashed it and said, look, we have to, the, the idea was, the, the whole idea of TV changed. Now TV is not considered a guest in the home. TV is considered part of the home, and they can do whatever they want, and they can message it however they want. When they first created television, they really saw it as, we are guests in your living room. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing as a guest that we can afford to do is offend you. You, you think the uh, people like uh, General Sarnoff felt they had a moral responsibility as well as they were trying to make money, plus there was a certain moral responsibility that went along with the product they were selling? I, I think that it, it was... For them, I think it really was just trying to make money, but I think mm -hmm. that they knew that there was a certain broadcasting responsibility to families and to upholding traditional American values. Mm -hmm. I think the creators felt a different sort of responsibility, which is the responsibility to change the status quo, which has always been their kind of MO. So, so right, right from the beginning, uh, although the, 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 the capitalists and entrepreneurs who are starting the television industry had essentially conservative sensibilities, the people they hired to produce the programming yeah. did not. That's right. They, they, they were all entertainment people, and entertainment folk, you know, tend to be liberal. Now, how did that relationship get inverted, or how did it change? Yeah, I mean, the, the way that it changed is over the course of the 1950s and 60s, the advertising industry starts to get more and more involved with television. Originally, television was actually, television programming was created to actually sell TV sets. That's how they made their money, was actually on the set, right? Uh -huh. Then it became, as TV sets became cheaper and cheaper, it became an advertising medium, or as Bill Paley called it, the best cigarette selling machine in the world, <laughs> right? It, it, it was all about selling product now. Right. And so, originally, the, the advertisers themselves had a lot of control over the medium because it was one advertiser per, per show, right? It was all block programming. That's why you had the General Electric Hour, mm -hmm. right? And, and so the advertisers didn't want to offend anyone either. Mm -hmm. Then TV realizes, wait a second, if we really want to make money here, we need, to, we need to break it up, and we need to sell advertising spots inside the program, and we need to sell multiple advertising spots. So that puts a lot of control away from the advertisers who can't afford to offend anyone and to the TV creators who can afford to offend people. The, the, the broadcasting companies realize this? Yeah, the broadcasting companies realize so this. So they, is decide, they didn't want thing. General Electric Theater. They wanted to be able to sell ads to all, all comers. Right, exactly. They wanted exactly. to open up the market, basically. Exactly. They wanted to open up the market. And, and so what that ended up doing is putting more and more hands in the power of the television networks. Now, at the same time, the advertising agencies, are, they, they, they've been churning out people who have been involved in the actual creative content because the early advertising industry, as I said, General Electric, when they did the GE Hour, right. the, the, the network was actually running the programming by GE. GE was involved in the making of the programming. So there's this, so the, the, the advertising industry starts to push its own executives into the TV industry now, right? It, it wants to kind of maintain a little bit of control and the people who have had a lot of control in the advertising industry of TV content now want to move into TV because TV is a lucrative space. So right. they all start moving there. Most of these people tend to be from New York, Upper West Side liberals, uh, and they've been, and, and they're kind of a cr combination of business and creatives. Uh, mm -hmm. The advertising industry is a very weird industry. It's not really businessmen. It's kind of right. artists slash businessmen. And so by the time you get to the mid to late 60s, you've been infused with a new set of executives who are less interested in business and more interested in pushing social messages. So you, 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 first you severed the uh, control or diminished the control of the capitalist entrepreneurs who started the television industry, and then you severed the connection between corporations like General Electric who have a reputational interest in making sure that the show they're sponsoring reflects values that are consistent with those of their customers, and finally who gets to be in charge of on TV. I mean, it, now, now you've got really a set of creators who are in charge. So now everybody's pulling in the same direction. It's a bunch of creative folks. I mean, like Leonard Goldberg, right, who's, who happens to be a political independent. But Leonard Goldberg, you know, he was an advertising executive. 
and then he became one of the heads of ABC. And then when he moved out of ABC, he became Aaron, Aaron Spelling's partner in creative content. That's very common. Right nowadays, you see executives who actually, when they leave the network, they become creatives. So they, they, they are creatives at heart. They, right. It's like a lot of you know, editors. Editors want to be authors. Um, and, and the same thing holds true. A lot of these executives really, really want to be TV creators. I think there's also a, a ground shift in, in really the early 60s with the assassination of Kennedy. When that happens, liberalism in the country as a whole shifts tremendously. And all of a sudden you move from this optimistic, starry-eyed liberalism of Kennedy, you know, we're moving into a new age, to the pessimistic liberalism of the 1960s. Everything's a failure. We have to destroy the entire society and tear it down in order to build it back right, up. Now, let, let, let's roll back a little bit. You know, you, you, in the 40s, as, as you chronicle, most American middle class families couldn't own TVs. I, th I think you write in the book that sometime in the 1950s, you had about 90% of American households there's a TV. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty much ubiquitous. But you know, if you go back, if you get on Netflix tonight, mm -hmm. you, know, you can pull up a lot of 1950s television shows. Yes. Yeah. And they might have been produced by people who, in your book, you say were liberals yeah. and had a liberal agenda. But those programs are not liberal. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, and, why is that? Uh, and that's because of that tension between the executives and the creators at that time. The executives wouldn't let them go very far. Mm -hmm. right? and, and beyond that, they, early television was also live, which meant that you really had to be careful in what you put on TV because right. there was no way to, there was not even a seven second delay in those days. That, right? that, this it went is in out. the early 50s. Right, this is in the early right. 50s. It was totally live. It was produced in New York, which is a more entrepreneurial town. Right. It, when, when TV goes taped, there's a, there's a little bit of a shift that the, the sort of opens the door because all of a sudden all the creatives basically move out to Hollywood. Well, when, all the executives. When does that happen? When does it? So you have this era where you have these live programs dominating. Yeah, late the 40s, early 50s, like it, 52. So so into the mid 50s, it starts to be taped programming. Yeah, it, like 1953, 1954, they start mm -hmm. doing taped programming. When that happens, there are a couple things that happen. One, they move all the production studios out to Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? And that separates automatically the executives from the from the creators. So the executives can, can't levy as much mm -hmm. weight to, to bring it to bear on the creatives. What was your rationale for bringing it out to Hollywood? Cheaper. It was cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and also the creatives The didn't... same reason they take it to Canada? Exactly. Now? Exactly. They're also, I mean, look, California in those days was, was actually not a socialist paradise. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it, it, it was, it's, it's kind of interesting. Once they do that, it forms this creative echo chamber. And that's the echo chamber that exists today. All the liberals in Hollywood you know, believe that they, uh, it's like the New Yorker cartoon, right? Remember that old New Yorker car cover mm -hmm. where it shows, you know, on one coast, here's New York, and then here's Hollywood, and then in between there's nothing, right? right? It's about, it's about like this big, and there's like right. a little thing of, of Chicago. That's kind of how they see it. And in Hollywood, it's so insular. Um, and part of the reason that it's so insular is because they've never really had to deal with the business interests. Look, the business of NBC is still run out of 30 Rock, right, in New York, mm -hmm. but NBC's production facilities are all in California. So you think when the production was still in New York and the capitalists are right on top of the creatives, it was a little better? Yeah, it, it was. I mean, they, they had to answer to them every day. And remember, nowadays, communication is really easy. But back in those days, you know, when they were taping the shows, it took a couple days for the, for the you know, or, or, you know, a day or two for the, for the film to actually get back to the executives in New York. So to, to produce a full show with, with all the vetting took a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. They didn't have as much time, so the creatives in Hollywood are able to start pushing the envelope. Not, not a ton, but just a little the, bit. The rain was loose, and so you go to these tape shows. But, so, so right, but these, these tape programs from the 50s that folks can watch on Netflix. Yeah, those are still, those are still relatively you know, moderate or conservative. Those are not, those are not radically liberal shows. The, the ones that I watch, they seem, even if they have elements in them, they'll call them adult content or whatever. Yeah. Ult ultimately, the message message of the show isn't immoral or anti-American. Right. They tend to be patriotic, generally reinforcing some sort of traditional moral value. Mm -hmm. But underneath, there's another tension going yeah, on. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that it's important to recognize that the liberalism of the 1950s is not the liberalism of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So liberals in the 1950s, the ones who are not you know, on the Soviet payroll, the, 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 <laughs> you know, those liberals actually tended to be patriotic liberals. I mean, look, Ronald Reagan at that time was a liberal. right? right? I mean, the, the, the fact, it, well, in, in, in the 40s anyway. Um, but you know, Gene Kelly right, was a patriotic liberal. There, there are people who, Elliot Kazan was a patriotic liberal. They, that patriotic liberalism was not an oxymoron at that point. They, they loved America, and they weren't totally alienated necessarily from the Judeo-Christian moral Th ethic That's right. Or at least, or at least they, they respected it enough not to openly rip it. Mm -hmm. And then once you get past the assassination of Kennedy, there's a fundamental rejection of everything American. I mean, it, it, it really takes place, I really believe, in, in the aftermath of that. It was as though Kennedy was the embodiment of all that was good about America. And when he was shot, the left immediately blamed the right wing, which was you know, insane because mm -hmm. it was obviously a communist who did it. But they, they immediately said, well, you know, we have a, a, a basic, uh, the entire country is culpable. As a country, we created the climate, right? It's the same thing they did with Gabby Giffords. We created the climate 
that created this shooting. And the, the death of Kennedy means the death of, of kind of starry-eyed aspirational liberalism. And we move into a period where we're going to attack Americans for being racist, sexist homophobes, who exploit people in the third world and like to kill brown people. And, and you, you obviously had a lot of different things going on in different parts of American culture. You had the anti-war movement, the hippie movement, all sorts of things were happening in the country. But you believe that the people creating entertainment in Hollywood were basically of that mindset. Yeah. The nineteen sixties countercultural mindset. Uh, they they were. And I think that they, they were moving in that direction even in the nineteen fifties, but with the with, with the loosening of the reins, really in the mid-60s, with a different set of executives, mm -hmm. things start to come out a little bit more. I mean, the truth is, even if you watch TV through, like, 1966, right. you're still talking about relatively moderate TV. You can, you know, if you watch I Spy with Bill Cosby, right, which is a, which is a liberal-leaning show only in that it was liberal on race, right? He's the first black, um, the first black lead mm -hmm. in, on TV. But, but the fact is that that show is not offensive to conservatives, right? right. It's only one. There are a few that are, right? This was The Week That Was, which is a short-lived mm -hmm. kind of comedy series in 1964. That one was really extreme, right? right? The Defenders with E.G. Marshall, which is a good show, it, was it, a liberal show. And, of course, but, flash forward, you have Bill Cosby having a, a tremendous show. It's all right. about family and, and tradition. Right, exactly. Um, and, it, well, I mean, what, what's so funny about that one is I spoke with Marcy Carcy, and they intended for that to be a liberal show, right? The whole thing was supposed to be... We're going, it was kind of a paternalistic liberalism, mm -hmm. right? We're going to show black people what you can accomplish, even if it's somewhat unrealistic. I mean, there are really not a ton of black families in the 1980s mm -hmm. where the father is an obstetrician and the mother's a lawyer, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's a two-family household and everybody's living in, in you know... But this is because of iconic American television. Right, and it, it turns out to be a very conservative show. I mean, when I rank conservative shows at the end of the book, I think Cosby Show comes in, like, number two because mm -hmm. the fact is that Cosby is a conservative ideal. Anybody can make it in America. Race is irrelevant. A two-parent family household is, is, is the one that counts, right? That's the one that matters. And parents should have the authority in that household. Right? And these are very conservative principles. Yeah, but you go back to the 1960s. To the degree that Hollywood is advancing the civil rights movement, equal rights, and equal protection law, that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And conservatives ought to be agreeing with that. But what are the things they're doing that maybe are contrary to traditional American beliefs and values? Uh, well, I mean, I think that they, they start infusing uh, an anti-war feel to a lot of their shows. Mm -hmm. uh, there are episodes of particular shows that I talk about in the book that are that are you know already kind of pushing on the Vietnam issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's an, an anti an anti anti communism I would say feel. I mean like in Twilight Zone, right? The, the very famous episode, The Monsters on Maple Street, right? The idea that they, these it, that we are so paranoid that we're going to kill each other, and the aliens kind of sit off in the distance and and laugh at us or say you know this is how humanity destroys itself, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, we're hunting down the people in our own town and we're stoning them, right? I mean that's the which is not really true. I mean, that's not what was going on in America. Even during the so-called Red Scare, nobody was going and you know beating down their neighbor's door with a Ben, with where, a, where, with where an do axe. you see the television industry in Hollywood totally coming out of the closet, yeah. leftists, and totally alienated from mainstream America? The, there's a real hard break in, in the late 1960s. Uh, it starts with Laughing. The Smothers Brothers is the first real breakthrough show. Those two shows are really the, two, the first two that, that break through and say, okay, we're going to go as hard left as we possibly can. And, and The Smothers Brothers, was done originally it was done not as a uh, it wasn't supposed to be a liberal show he was supposed to be these two brothers who who you know did straight comedy um, and the Smothers Brothers happened to be very, very liberal themselves. And so they, they gradually started infusing the show with as much liberalism as humanly possible. They actually got the show canceled because they offended LBJ, right? LBJ basically <laughs> called up the head of the network and he said, you've got to cancel the show because the it's too anti-Vietnam. The guy who, along with FDR, invented the modern welfare system. Right, exactly. He was too conservative. It, exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. And so but, but the, the place where the entire industry shifts, those are kind of the first notes that are, that are sounded mm -hmm. from the orchestra. Mm -hmm. the, the place where the entire industry shifts is in 1970, 1971. At that point in time, CBS is destroying everybody in the ratings, destroying them with shows like Beverly Hillbillies, Green Acres, and Petticoat Junction, right? All of which... Rural oriented. Uh, right, they're, they're rural, yeah. and they tend to be... You know, they, they, there's a little bit of raciness to Beverly Hillbillies if you look back on it, but, it's, but these are relatively conservative shows because the idea is rural is good, urban is bad, right? We're going to make fun of the urban folks. Mm -hmm. um, and CBS is destroying... It. These are all top ten shows. I mean, they're doing amazing business. Well, ABC is getting its butt handed to it in terms of ratings. So what do they do? They say, okay, we don't have as many eyeballs as CBS, but what we really need to do, we need to somehow convince the advertisers that they ought to advertise with us anyway. So they go out and they have a guy named Paul Lazarsfeld do some social research for them. Paul Lazarsfeld happens to be a Frankfurt School guy. He was a, he was a socialist in orientation. They have him do some research that says the, the people who are worth advertising to are young urban liberals 18 to 49. Right now, this is very convenient for ABC because all of its viewers are young urban liberals, 18 to 49. They take that social science data, and just like the left is fond of doing, you know, the left always 
resonates to bad social science data, and whether it's you know, Brown versus Board, which is a good decision but based on bad social science data, or Roe versus Wade, which is a bad decision based on bad social science data. Um, the, they, they resonate to social science data. So they, the, the advertising industry looks at this and they say, 18 to 49, that sounds right to me. Now, all the people who are saying this are 18 to 49 young urban liberals, right? So they say, we're going to put all our dollars into ABC now, even though ABC is getting its butt kicked in the ratings. Yeah. And so you, with shows like The Mod Squad, and you know, so they start doing that, and CBS looks at this, and CBS has a shift in the executive structure right at this point, right? They, they move away from numbers-based people to some, a guy named Bob Wood, who's very programming-based. I'm going to go by my gut. And yeah. he says, we need to dump all of our rural programming, and we need to put in MASH, Mary Tyler Moore, and All in the Family. And we need to target that 18 to 49 demographic, even though it makes no sense, yes. intuitively speaking. You know, um, this is a revela revelation in your book, I think. I mean, if, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is you can have television program A and it can have 10 million people watching it. And you can have television program B and it has 2 million people watching it. And they go to the advertisers and say, you know, the 2 million people watching our show are all 18 to 28 years old and they live in New York and L.A. and San Francisco. And the 10 million people watching that other show, they tend to live in Iowa, North Dakota, Alabama, of Virginia and Maine, and they're 50 years old. Yep. And so the advertisers are going to pay more money to the 2 million people than the 10 million. People. Absolutely. The Good Wife, right in his first season, had, had higher ratings than Glee, right? It had, had very good ratings, and, it had, and but its entire audience was 50 plus. This is this old true today. Glee was getting $47 per thousand viewers right. in its advertising. Good Wife was getting less than half of that, even though it had bigger viewership, because right. Glee was based on the 18 to 49 myth. Now, it is a myth. I mean, the fact is, who has disposable income in this country? It isn't people who are 18 yeah. to 34. Those are people living in their parents' basement smoking dope, right? I mean, they're... <laughs> and I, I, you know, corollary to this, I often look, I mean, all the time, I'm looking at the Gallup tracking poll for President Obama, and once a week, Gallup puts out the demographics of its poll. And, mm -hmm. if, and if you look in there, one of the breakdowns they have is age groups. Yep. And each, the older each, the one age group actually where Obama has majority support or approval is among the youngest people. Exactly. The older people get, the less they like them. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So and the same demographic, it's the, 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 the group that haven't grown up yet, they haven't been fully educated, they haven't, they haven't taxes, raised yep. a family, they're not trying to buy a home, they're not, they're the ones that Hollywood has convinced the advertising industry they need to read. Exactly, you're right on the money. And that's why, when, when, and that's why it's such a lie when the left says, you know, if you don't like it, turn your channel. We can turn our channels, they won't change their programming because right. the, we're not the people who are important to them. The right. people who are important to them are not going to change the channel because they like this stuff. They've rigged it. I mean, the same way that if CNN does a poll that 60% Democrats and 40% Republicans, and then magically Obama has a 62% approval rating, right? That's the same way that the TV industry works. They say, you know, we're going to stack it 18 to 49. Oh, look, we have tons of viewers who are in that target age group. Yeah, because that's your target age well, group. Well, let's step back a little bit. There's, the census said there are 308 million people in the United mm -hmm. States. States last year. Mm -hmm. On any given night, how many people are watching the primetime programming on CBS or ABC or NBC? 30 million, maybe? 30 million. So about 10%. Yeah. 90%, more than 90% of Americans aren't watching that. Yeah. So they're missing something. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, it, it, and that's, that would be a, that would be a, a relatively big night. To, to uh, yeah, 30, 35 million people. Um, that's the, a lot of people are watching cable now. Um, a lot of people aren't watching TV at all, or they're they're on the internet. Um, you know, right. the, the the fact is that. But if uh, you put a football, a really good football. Well, game look, the on, Super Bowl will get you know, people, 100 million people, right? I mean, uh, 150 million people. They have half the country so watching it. A very good big football game is many times fold more popular than an entertainment program on a prime Oh, yeah. Program. I mean, and the fact is that the most popular programming right now is not scripted TV. It's reality TV. Right. Right. I mean, American Idol is the most popular show on television. And so, you know, Dancing with the Stars is incredibly popular, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the Voice is doing pretty well on NBC. The, mm -hmm. the fact is reality programming tends to do well because the basis of reality programming is competition. Mm -hmm. In, you know, it's a zero-sum game, which is not a conservative idea, but it's a, but it's a competition, which right. is a very conservative idea because there's no affirmative action in any of these competitions, right? If you stink on American Idol, you're not making the finals. It doesn't matter what your backstory is. American Idol actually lets the voters, the, the viewers, vote. Right, exactly. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's almost ideal republicanism at work, right? It, so, so would you argue there's sort of an opportunity cost that Hollywood's paying here? They're, they're leaving 90% of the potential audience on the table yeah. in order to advance what? In order to advance their agenda, and, in or, and, and the way that they are able to monetize this is, number one, by bamboozling the advertisers, and number two, by focusing on narrow casting. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they say, okay, we don't have that many eyeballs, but the eyeballs that we have for a particular advertiser are the ones that are important. 
right? So Home and Garden Network. Most people don't watch it. Most people you know, don't care about it. Mm -hmm. But if you're the weed whacker company, those are the people who you want to target. So they've narrow casted all of these channels. And this is why, by the way, everybody always asks, you know, why are there 800 channels and there's nothing for me to watch? Because they're not targeting you. They're not interested in you, right? I mean, 790 of those channels are not interested in you. Even people who have cable and watch a lot of TV watch maybe 10 or 15 networks. You know, you make a great point that at one point, these television programs coming out of Hollywood were designed so mom and dad and the kids could all watch them together, and they were potentially a bonding thing. Yep. It's passive, you're watching TV, but it's bonding, but that's not the way it is anymore. No, I mean, now it's about fragmentation, right? I think that it actually breaks down the family structure, because instead, it used to be like, take the Cosby shows, it's a good example, right? Dad would identify with Bill, and mom would identify with the wife, and the kids would identify with the kids, not only was everybody watching it together and enjoying it together, but everybody was identifying with the person in the family structure that they ought to be emulating. And the values right? they were transmitting were actually good ones. Right, exactly. Um, and now, the way that TV works is that we don't target dad as the dad in the family. We target dad as, as basically as though you were a teenage boy, right? I mean, he, we target dad with ESPN, who watches sports, with Spike TV. Mm -hmm. Right, because he wants to, is it because dad is still a guy and he still wants to see, you know, things blowing up in boobs. <laughs> and, and we target mom with Home and Garden and we target mom with, with Lifetime, you know, Channel for Women. And, and we target the kids with MTV and, and specifically, so everybody is in a different room watching a different set of shows. Well, that's Hollywood's ideal America. If you have the half kid, he's in the other room watching some idiot That's show. it, that, right. That, that, that's exactly right because <laughs> they, then they can monetize it to that specific, n you know, niche group. Now, that, that's from a market perspective. That's justifiable, but, from, but in a certain sense, it really isn't because you're leaving so much on the table. It's the same reason why Hollywood makes tons of rated R movies because they tend to be lower budget than, than G-rated movies. G-rated movies, you know, have a $100 million budget. You can make an R-rated movie for $5 million, $10 million. As, as a cultural phenomenon, it's destructive. But let me, so let me ask you about the agenda of Hollywood, what they're pushing through the shows. What does Hollywood think about the traditional family, a mom and a dad and kids? Well, I mean, that's a, they, they believe in the, the Mrs. Doubtfire view of the family. I mean, I can, my, my cousin is actually the little girl in Mrs. Doubtfire, but they, they believe in the Mrs. Doubtfire view of the family, right? Ah, children, there are many types of families. There's two mothers and two fathers. Right? I mean, they, they really don't believe that a man and a woman ought to be the ideal. Look at Modern Family as an example, right? Modern Family is a very popular show among both liberals and conservatives. Mm -hmm. It's popular among conservatives because it still pushes the notion of family, right. but it's very liberal in the notion that anybody can be a family, right? There's a gay couple with a kid on the show, right. um, and the idea is every family is basically equal. They're it, trying to denormalize the traditional family. Right, exactly, it, exactly. And that's, that's what they really feel. I mean, it was so fascinating. I, th I was talking to... I think and they, was, when they're putting together programming, they're actually thinking, let's get this message across. Yeah, I mean, well, it, what they say... What they say, it, part, part of it is conscious, part of it is unconscious. What they tend to say is, no, we're just reflecting the society around us. We're not transforming society, we're reflecting society. Mm -hmm. Well, they are to a certain extent. They're reflecting the lives that they lead. They're reflecting the lives that, you know, of the people around them in Los Angeles or San Francisco or New York, which is the place that most, mm -hmm. most of these people are from. They're certainly not reflecting the lives of anybody in the middle of the country. They're transforming those lives. So for a group of people who are, are you know, constantly talking about xenophobia and, and, and mm -hmm. how we need to understand other cultures, they don't understand the mainstream culture of America, but, and they certainly can't take themselves out of, you know, outside their own life. And of course, there's sort of the supply creates demand here, isn't there? I mean, if, since they've, they've narrowed in on this market and they've left the other 90% of it on the table, yeah. don't they have an interest in creating more people like that? They, they do have an, I mean, that, that's a really good point. They have an interest in converting people to that, to that sort of to be philosophy because then they can target them with the programming that they want to target their them They're customers for their show and their constituents for their preferred politicians. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's, that's, that's a great point. And the fact is that it's even, it, it's even more obvious than, than that in terms of there's an actual relationship between Democrats in government and people in Hollywood, right? I mean, they, right. They, the money actually flows in a giant circle. They, they convert people to a liberal point of view. The, li the people who are now converted to a liberal point of view give money to the, to the Democratic politicians. Right. The Democratic politicians turn around and kick back money to Hollywood. Right. So it's a nice, it's a nice liberal there, there's circle. There's a real hardwired connection there. Yeah, abso that's absolutely. And my, my favorite story uh, about that, it, this is one of my favorite stories in, in the book, is the story of, you remember when President Obama did the Henry Louis Gates um, press yes. conference, mm -hmm. right? Everybody acted stupidly. Well, it, what people forget is that in the lead up to that press conference, he did it in prime time on, on all three, on, on the three major networks. Fox didn't run it. Fox actually won the night with a rerun of So You Think You Can Dance, right? So that, I mean, nobody wanted to watch President Obama. All the networks didn't want to run this thing. All of them. They all said, you know, he's losing in ratings. He, nobody, nobody wants him. You know, we're going to lose money. So what did he do? He went over their heads 
to the people who are the heads of the corporate entities that own the networks, right? He went to Jeff Immelt at GE, he went to Bob Iger at Disney, and he went to Les Moonves at CBS. Now, it just so happens that about a year later, he appointed Bob Iger to a government position. Right. He, the, the Les, Moonves is a, a, Les Moonves is a businessman, but he also happens to be a, a, a guy who is supremely liberal. I mean, he visited Cuba to go hang out with Castro when it was, you know, when it was illegal. It still is illegal, but he, he did that you know, when it was super illegal and he got fined like 50 grand for it. Um, and, and uh, you know, obviously Jeff Immelt is in President Obama's pocket. So he calls up all of, the, all of the heads of the networks and he says, I want you to put me on the air. They say, okay, fine, we'll put you on the air. About two weeks later, the New York Times reports that the pharmaceutical industry has bought into Obamacare, right? They say that because Obama has capped their liability at $80 billion over 10 years. Now, this is seemingly unrelated, right? What does this have to do? Well, about six paragraphs down in the article, it's buried that as part of this deal, the pharmaceutical industry has to spend $150 million on television advertising in favor of Obamacare. Convenient. Right, very convenient, right? So he, he basically went to them and he said to them, okay, look, I, I know you're going to lose money on this, but don't worry. I'm going to make sure that you make up that money. The fact is the Obama administration, the Obama campaign. It's about as crony capitalism as you can get. That's exactly right. The, the, the Obama campaign spent a grand total in 2008 of $250 million on television advertising in this one shot. Right, they 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 got 150 million dollars. So these in these are some capitalists that Obama likes. Well, right. I mean, this is I mean, this is one of the great misnomers of the of, uh, right. that the left puts out there. Right, all of these big businesses. You know, the, the Republicans are working with big business and they're all right. corrupt. Look, the fact is, big business is not capitalist. Right. Big business is corporatist. They have an interest in big government. That's exactly like right. That. They have an interest in big government. They support it. They work with it. And as you point out, they can capitalize yeah, on it. Yeah, I mean, it. it's so funny. I've gotten yeah, so the part of their agenda is they don't like the traditional family. What about abortion? Where does Hollywood stand on, on babies? Well, right now they've kind of shied away from the issue because the American people have basically rejected the liberal argument. But when they do show abortion, it is always, what they, they do it through plot, right? I mean, they understand it makes a character unlikable if she has an abortion. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do it, if you're going to have a character have an abortion, which it has become a lot more rare. In the 1970s, it was all over the place, right? Because they were trying to convince people. They tried to do it. Right. They tried to do it with, with Maud, right? They tried to do it on All in the Family. They, there are a bunch of abortion episodes in the 1970s, specifically geared toward you know, pushing Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is right. And even before Roe v. Wade, there are a bunch of abortion episodes because Roe v. Wade doesn't happen until 73. And there are a bunch of you know, episodes from 1970 to 73 on abortion, saying abortion is, is basically an affirmative good. Um, nowadays, people recognize they, the, even liberals have been backed into a corner, which is why you have Bill Clinton saying it should be safe, legal, and rare, which is an oxymoron if I ever heard it. But, but, he, but, he, he, but basically, the perspective on abortion is if they're going to tackle it, what they do is they skew the plot, right? What the, even conservatives, most conservatives, are okay with abortion in these, unless, you, unless you're totally Not Catholic me. on the issue. No, abortion only in cases of rape, incest, and where the life of the mother is in danger, mm -hmm. right? I mean, polls show that, that conservatives tend to make exception mm -hmm. on, on those three issues. Yeah, I have to say, I part. don't, but I don't. Right, you're but, saying politically, if you look at it. Right, poli politically, those are the, mm -hmm. if there are exceptions, those are the ones that people right. resonate to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially incest and mother's life in danger. Right. Um, but, but what Hollywood does is whenever they show an abortion case, it is all three, right? It's, it's usually, you know, so this, the, uh, an innocent girl got raped by her father, and now she, and now, you know, her life will be endangered if she has the baby because she has preeclampsia or something, right? I mean, right. this is, this is, this is what they do, right? They, they, they and then, look for the hard case to propagandize. That's exactly right. That's abortion. exactly right. I mean, in, in the legal sphere, we say hard cases make bad law, right? That's what right. they do. They, they create hard cases to make bad law. By the way, and as you may know, here's one place where maybe Hollywood's losing because actually Gallup poll shows that younger people tend to be more pro-life yeah. than older people. Well, I mean, it's a, Although the majority of Americans are for protecting babies most of the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that they, this is an issue where Hollywood is losing, but I think that you know, they, they won legislatively, so they've been on the defensive ever since Roe. I mean, the fact is that Roe was such an enormous victory for them because before Roe, I mean, right. if, you, if, you, if you polled Americans in 1950 on abortion, it's right. like probably 90-10. They're, right? they're losing in the culture. But right. They're not, they haven't yet lost politically. Right. Which is why they need five people on the Supreme Court. On well, th that's right. I, abortion has become, what they've actually done is they've, they've substituted single motherhood for abortion. Right. Single motherhood is now an affirmative good. Right. right, so so instead, they, they realize abortion is too much for most people. People don't like abortion. Right. But the case that they made instead is, okay, well, she won't have an abortion, but it's okay if she gets pregnant out of wedlock. She'll just have the baby, and the, the father won't be around. But that's that's, that's the that's, same that's as fine. having a mom that's and a dad, a, dad, right? So right. they've shifted their focus. Well, and, in and a they also way. they also in their home state of California, they lost the marriage amendment. Yeah, and uh, which well, this is them crazy. Well, right, this is if there is one dividing line in Hollywood between working and not working, it's it's Prop Eight. If you contributed to Prop Eight. If you believe strongly 
that marriage should be between a man and a woman, you will not work that, in Hollywood, that, period, end character. of story. You're, it is, you're dead. If, Patri look, Patricia if you, Heaton. If you, if you made it clear that you supported defining marriage as between a man and a woman, which has been since the beginning of the human race. Yes. Then you're blacklisted. You're done. Hollywood you're done. Absolutely done. It. Look, even people who are conservative in Hollywood, you know, the so-called Hollywood conservative contingent, the Don Belisarios, the Jerry Bruckheimers, they are not socially conservative. Patricia Heaton, right, right who is very anti-abortion, Patricia Heaton came out about two weeks ago, and she said, yeah, I've been discriminated against in Hollywood, but look, I'm not one of these, like, anti-gay marriage people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't know what Patty's position is on, on gay marriage. I, I, you know, it's possible that she's pro-gay marriage, but the, but the bottom line to me is, she has to say that or she will lose her career. That is how it, it really is that blatant. And well, this is an outrage. How do you fix it? Well, I mean, I think in that case, what we really need to do is sue some people. I mean, because that is, that's, that's basic religious discrimination, right? That's in violation of Equal Employment Opportunity Commission rules and regulations right. because you are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion. And let's be real about this. The, for, for a lot of people, it is a religious principle that, that, tr that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Right. I mean, the, the Prop 8 effort was largely bankrolled by the Mormon church. Right? I mean, there was a lot of Mormon money behind that as a religious principle. So right. you know, the, I think lawsuits are one way to do that. But I think that you know, in terms of fixing the industry as a whole, there are a couple things that we're doing. One is we're putting a ton of pressure on... Well, let, me, let me roll you back there for a second. Now, you're saying that if you're publicly known as someone who supports traditional marriage and think the law ought to reflect traditional marriage, which is, in fact, a, a biblical thing. Yeah. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. It, it, so that anybody who ascribes to any traditional religion ascribes to that definition of marriage, which is why the majority of Americans, when they're allowed to vote, they say marriage is between a man and a woman. Right, always. If you hold that view, you're saying that, forget it, you're not going to work in Hollywood. That's right. Because of your religious conviction, and you have had the gall to actually publicly express your religious conviction, right. simply in defense of the, the core institution of human civilization. That's right, because, because the left believes that if you are anti-gay marriage, you hate gay people, that you're, 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 you're the type of person who you know, killed Matthew Shepard. You're the type of person who is for discrimination against gays in employment. You're the type of uh, You are an evil human being. So, 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 so Ben, you think that, that people ought to sue? That, well, that people who are pro marriage clear, ought to sue? In, cl in clear cases of discrimination, I think absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, I'm, not, I'm not advocating. Look, I'm, I'm not a, a lawsuit happy guy. I really am not. Um, as a conservative, I despise lawsuits. And as a lawyer, I can tell you most lawsuits are a waste of time. But if, you're be if you lose your job, because you come out and say, you know, I gave money to Prop 8. And people have done this, and people have lost their jobs. Absolutely, you should sue somebody, because that is basic discrimination on the basis of religion, and that is inappropriate. And look, liberals have, have used the law as a wedge to, to take over a lot of major institutions. Um, and there's no reason why conservatives shouldn't fight back especially on the grounds that liberals have been trying to claim for years and years, right? These are the people who say that we're there for tolerance and diversity, but when it comes to political diversity, they're totally uninterested in it, utterly uninterested, right? These are the same people who said McCarthyism was the worst thing in the world, open communists, people who are being paid by the Soviet government should be allowed to work in Hollywood. But if you're a traditional conservative, you shouldn't be allowed to work in Hollywood. All right, Ben, on the big picture, no doubt going forward, we have huge technological changes in the delivery of video entertainment. Ha taking advantage of that, dealing with that, what do people who love America and believe in traditional values, what do they do going forward to make sure they win this battle in the long run? I mean, I think, first of all, we need to take entertainment seriously. I mean, this is, this is just, uh, conservatives tend to be very serious people, and we tend to think idealistically, okay, well, you know what, I will turn off the TV, I'll never watch anything that I don't like. Realistically speaking, people don't do that. People watch TV, um, and so, and they watch movies. And you know what, I'd rather go watch a movie like Avatar than I would watch a movie like American Carol. Not because Avatar is pro-America, it's tremendously anti-America, but because Avatar is a decent movie and American Carol was not a very good movie. So people, when they, when they watch entertainment, they turn off their brains. They turn off their political side. They just want to watch the entertainment, but it shapes our values nonetheless. And narrative is unbelievably effective in pushing a political viewpoint. I mean, I gave this example, I spoke at Heritage Foundation yesterday, and I gave this example, I said, you know, the fact is that every year in America, there are 1,456,000 abortions that take place in the first trimester. Then I told a story about one girl who, you know, she, she wanted to have an abortion because she'd gotten pregnant out of wedlock. She was 16 years old. She thought that it was going to ruin her life. She goes to the clinic, right, and, she, and there's a girl who's standing outside who's chanting and saying, you know, there's, you can't, your baby has a life of its own. Every baby wants to live. And she kind of ignores it. And then the girl says to her, well, you know, your baby has a heart. And she kind of ignores it. And she says, you know, your baby has fingernails. And the girl says, Okay, and she goes inside the abortion clinic, she's going to go through with it, and she starts looking around and she sees people, you know, tapping on the table with their fingernails and biting their fingernails, and, and all of a sudden it occurs to her, oh my God, this is a human being, and she walks out and she doesn't have the abortion. 
And I asked people, I, I pulled the audience, I said, okay, now how many of you remember the statistic that I gave you a minute 30 seconds ago about how many abortions take place in the first trimester? Now how many of you remember the reason the girl walked out of the abortion clinic? Right. right, and the narrative works because the fact is that you know the 140, you know 1 million 456 thousand. That's just a statistic to people. It goes in one ear, it goes out the other. But stories work. So conservatives have to start finding good stories and telling them. That's exactly right, and we need to get good at telling them. Right, we need to we need to create in the, the way the left has been able to be so effective is they create characters and storylines we want to spend time with. Right, we spend to more time on average, with the TV than we do with our own families, <laughs> right, at night, right? We, we watch two to three hours of TV a night as Americans. That's because they created a set of characters who we like and want to hang out with. And then they take those characters and have them engage in pursuits that we hate, but we like the characters, so we're willing to overlook it, and we start to tolerate it. Will and Grace and Ellen have made more difference in the gay rights movement than, you know, gays marching down Westwood, uh, marching down Santa Monica Boulevard in California wearing assless chaps, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> the, the fact is that, that, that Entertainment matters. So that's, that's the first thing. We need to recognize that, and we need to get involved. We need less you know, conservative lawyers. We need less conservative dog catchers. We need more conservative script writers. So that last, last question, Ben. You're from Hollywood. You grew up there. You know it inside out. Are you going to get involved in producing entertainment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've actually signed on to a 501c3 called Declaration Entertainment. Um, and Declaration is specifically dedicated to creating film that's great and that happens to have conservative values. And I, I put it that way because I, I always shy away from conservative entertainment because it implies that the conservatism comes first. The entertainment has to come first or no one's going to watch. So, you know, we're, we're out there fundraising and we're encouraging people to go to declarationentertainment.com and, and you know, sign up for a membership and, and, and start contributing that way. And, you know, we, we're going to do internship programs, teach people how to write scripts. My, my buddy Jeremy Boring is down on the border right now shooting a movie called The Arroyo, which is basically a cross between No Country for Old Men and High Noon um, about illegal immigration. And he's doing it on a, on a micro budget. He's doing it for like 100 grand. Right? It doesn't take a lot of money. The nice thing is that the means of production have gotten so cheap and the means of distribution via the internet have gotten so cheap that you can make a successful movie for a very small amount of money. But we need to start directing our money and our efforts at, at infiltrating this industry and really making a difference so in this industry. So people can go to declarationentertainment.com yeah. and see what you're doing Absolutely. and what this organization is doing. Ben Shapiro, author of Primetime Propaganda, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me.